We're on a roll. Well, exactly. You do. <laughs> we very much are. Our minds are synced. I can tell you're kind of <laughs> saying what's coming. And that's just what I was thinking when I, we're on a roll. So we just as well go for that. So <clears throat> I often think about why is human nutrition so confusing? You know, yesterday's really solid advice becomes today's, well, it doesn't hold any water, becomes tomorrow's who knows what. You know, it's it's very, uh, it's pretty amazing in that sense. And our view of cholesterol, carbs, fat, just as, as buzzwords that, that uh, uh, so much is, is changing relative to what's being written and thought about related to those things. Um, I also, with the people I'm working with nowadays, we, we think a lot about what's the basal diet that people in different cultures are on, and how's that affecting outcomes, just as I was alluding to earlier, and whether it's it's eggs or meat or fat. And Stefan uh, Duke really is keeping on top of that, and he sent me several papers that said, well, you know, this culture responded differently from this culture, responded differently from this culture, and all, all that gets in into the mix of it. So, um, I thought this was hilarious related to the confusion. We're so happy to have everyone home for the holidays. Your dad has been cooking all day. But a braised bacon wrap with my famous apple sage stuffing. Who wants one? None for me, honey. I'm on a diet. Did you say butter braised? Because I'm dairy free. I'm lactose intolerant. I'm gluten free. No stuffing for me, honey. I'm on. I don't eat meat anymore, except for fish and chicken. Just not turkey. Is that free wing? Did they die of natural causes? Was it an assisted suicide? Because that is the most morally delicious. Nothing for her. She's just difficult. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Dig in. Brought to you by Canada's Liquor Corporation. <laughs> Christmas, like food. <laughs> I tell you, some. Oh no, so no, we saw that. But it is amazing how some, uh, how, how they're able to catch some of that in a very short piece that just hits on a. Uh, all of that, but you know, the confusing part, and it was being illustrated in that, you have not only the biochemical complexity that uh, we've talked about, but the, the individuality that was being expressed around the table, diet, lifestyle, culture kind of things, and then the beliefs, the, the overall beliefs that we developed. So let's talk about beliefs a little bit related to this, this topic, which takes us into the placebo and nocebo kind of effects. There's a, a, a psychologist, Paul Rosen is his name. I met him many, many years ago at a conference in Sicily. I had read his work. He's one of the old, old gurus in this uh, food selection, nutrition, nutritional wisdom. And then he really got into human food selection as it went on. But he, he was doing a series of studies to show really what you said, Steve, how profoundly what we come to believe influences how we, we behave. And this is just one of a series of studies, but he was doing a survey as part of this, and he was asking people, um, you know, if you were going to be stranded on a desert island for a year, which one of those foods would you take with you? Obviously, that's horrible choices. And it's only one food. He's saying, you know, all you can take is one food. But he wanted to see what, what would people say. And here were the responses. Going to a desert island, 42% said, well, we'd take bananas with us. 12% corn, 7% um, sprouts, 27% uh, spinach, 5% peaches, 4% said hot dogs, 3% said chocolate milk. Now, in relation to the overall series of studies that he was doing, the point he was trying to make was that these two foods would probably take you further down the road than any of the rest of these foods. If you were, had that terrible choice, these yeah. could probably take you further down the road, but they were the choices that people didn't want. 
And he was arguing that that was because of police that had been developed around fat and phobia of fat. Is, if you saw the broader context, this, this fits perfectly with, with that statement. So the power of beliefs to influence the choices that we make. And this broader topic of how, how you know, how did fat become toxic? And uh, some of the books that have been written and papers that have been written that go back to, to Ansel Keys and some of the studies that they were doing back many, many years ago now, some of the huge studies they did, the Minnesota study and uh, uh, the, the other study that they, they did. And they were really, um, you know, really arguing that fat was the culprit. And so over time, then we've really come to, you know, lean meat, margarine, um, skim Low milk. Fat milk. Yes, absolutely. You know, and, and all of these kinds of foods have really become toxic. Yet, from a palate standpoint, for me, I strongly prefer the, these to, to this one here, you know, and that's, that's fitting more with what people are, are now, the arguments that people are making, that we went way overboard related to cholesterol and fat and, and so forth. And as you know, if you follow this, there, there's still really divergent, divergent views on that from respective people on both sides of the argument. But yeah, and they also have a mistaken view of many of what these things mean. Most people think that when you talk about 2% milk, for example, that they're only taking out half of the fat. Well, actually, yeah. what they're doing is they're taking skim milk and putting 2% of the fat back into it. Yes. Absolutely, absolutely. So it goes back to the whole issue of confusion, huh? And it's no wonder that um, that people are really skeptical about the latest, you know, any of the latest nutrition advice and, and so forth. Um, um, you know, for me, um, I spent a year as an au pair girl in France in my youth, and that really influenced me a lot. But I've also always been kind of a skeptic. Yes, yeah, I can imagine that year in France. And when you go, and probably many of you have, I've spent a lot of time in France with Michel Mireille, actually, that I talked about earlier. And yeah, it's very interesting to see, um, to see the culture and the food culture and what they do as a part of, of, of that culture. It, it's pretty, pretty neat, I think. <clears throat> I often think too that it's a challenge nowadays um, to, and you raised this point, Merle, you know, at least to me, as I was interpreting, you know, how, how do you get in sync with your own body and the knowledges of that body? And, uh, you know, to what degree do the authority figures that we, we've heard from forever influence um, influence that relationship. So I want to give three examples here that relate to placebo and nocebo effects and you know how experiences influence what we perceive, how we believe, and then, and then how we come to behave. And in saying what I'm going to say, it's just in kind of amazement and um, at the, the power of, of that experience and I'm not saying I'm any different from anyone else in all of this, you know, not saying that's sitting back in some judgment. It's like, it's amazing the power of this. And I often try to think about, well, you know, to what degree am I actually able to, to separate some of those things out in, in the foods I select? But, you know, many people believe they have adverse reactions to wheat, and certainly many people do and some of the modern varieties of wheat. We know if you go to France or, and eat some of the old varieties, some people that have really bad problems here don't have, in the US with, with the modern grains, don't have problems at all. So I, I wanna acknowledge first that the, these can be real, but some of the studies I found really amazing were, were clearly nocebo effects where people, when they, when they studied and ran them through trials that would reveal this, people fed high gluten, low gluten, and no gluten food, 
have pain, bloating, and nausea and gas to a similar degree, no matter, it's what they were being told. So on there, I'm no gluten food. They say, oh, this is a high gluten food. Boy, do they ever get sick. Do you know what I mean? It, the, the studies are illustrating really strong nocebo kind of effects. And some of the people that I was following when I was writing Nourishma, who were doing the study say, as far as we can tell physiologically, these people have, do not have uh, issues. It's, it's more what they've come to believe about that. So that's one example. Another example that I found, found really interesting was when people were told they were served exactly the same piece of meat, but they were told on the one hand that the meat was factory farmed um, or it was humane conditions. And when they were told the piece of meat was coming from a factory farm and all the negatives associated with that, to the people, the samples looked and smelled less pleasant they tasted saltier and greasier. In other words, the power of what they were being told was influencing their perception of the taste of, of that meat. Um, I find it interesting too, and again, I'm not being the, the, the critic here, but I, or the judge or anything, but just reflecting, <clears throat> you know, there are a number of reasons why people go on vegetarian or vegan diets. Um, now we have issues related to changing climates and, and, uh, and allegations related to, to red meat and uh, you know how bad it can be for the climate. We have issues related to animal welfare and the CAFO, the, the confinement feeding operations and, and how bad those are. And we also have issues related to, to sentience and, and the growing appreciation that, that these animals are sentient beings, uh, which they are. And so, you know, I, I, I understand why, why people make those choices. Um, but it's interesting, some of the, the work that they're doing, brain scan work, and, uh, and then um, talking to people who have gone vegan, and then after a long period have tried meat again, all those point to, <clears throat> um, so in the brain scan studies, while vegans report a lower desire to eat meat compared with omnivores, their neural activity reveals an inherent craving for meat. And I can share those papers with you. If I'm just briefly summarizing, but what they're saying and what the, what's, what's, the neural activity is revealing are two different things. And these findings to me highlight a dissonance between acquired beliefs and attitudes and inherent needs for nutrients contained in meats. There are things, like we talked earlier, there are nutrients in meat that are not so readily provided by a by plant-based diet. And so I think th this becomes really revealing about the wisdom body and then trying to tap into that. And then this, this layer that comes over that of, of what we're told and the influences of, of some of these other um, social and environmental kinds of influences. And th this is taking place at a physiological level. I I'm just giving samples of, of some of the studies and I I'm just giving a sample here, there's more than more studies than what I'm showing that, that reveal this. But in these studies, they were working with milkshakes and uh, it was the same milkshake, had the same amount of calories in it. And then they were looking at, at guline, the hunger hormone, which affects appetite and plays key role in the rate and use, rate of use and distribution of energy in our bodies. And so <clears throat> depending on what they told people, it totally re influenced this hormonal response in the body. Uh, Ghrelin decreases after an 80 calorie milkshake labeled indulgent, 620 calories, but not after an identical milkshake labeled sensible, 140 calories. So physiologically, the body is responding based on what was being told 
um, more than what, what was actually in the milkshake. To me, I find these kind of responses and linking back with what, what you were saying, you, you folks were saying, uh, amazingly interesting and powerful, huh? They're powerful kind of things that, that are affecting outcomes. As I was preparing the book, I came across a, a, some articles on John Whitley, and uh, he had been diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer, which is really basically a death sentence, you're, you're doomed. Determined to beat the odds though, he entered into a, an experimental trial where some of the per, uh, people got, a, got the experimental drug, others got the placebo. And so he had a ritual that he entered into. Each afternoon, as he sat in his apartment and took the drug, he told himself, this is a miracle drug, it's going to save my life. Well, they went through the trial, and at the end of the trial, <clears throat> They were assessing people in, in both the treatment and the control groups. And um, the oncologist then got back with John and he said, John, I've got amazing news for you. You are cancer free. Um, but he said, here's the thing, John, you were in the placebo group, you weren't in the treatment group. So again, to me, it illustrates the power of what one comes to believe, and you know, a lot is being written and discussed about, about what happened with John, but um, you know, it, may, it makes me appreciate and think about the power of what we, what we're, what we believe, and the power of, of all that to, to positively or negatively affect outcomes. I'll give you another example, a last one, from an, a, a negative standpoint, Anita's book, Dying to Be Me, My Journey from Cancer to Near Death to True Healing. Um, it's an, um, to me, it was an amazing book, reading, reading Anita's account of this. And she concludes, and I'll tell you the story just briefly, but she concludes, I had a choice to come back. So she, she had a near-death experience and that was amazing to read what, what had happened. And, but at the end of that, she said, I had a choice to come back or not. I chose to return when I realized that heaven is a state, not a place. And I, I think of that all the time. Um, and that's the last section I get into that. But anyway, she, she was a very conflicted lady throughout the early part of of her life. She was raised in a very strong Hindu family, very strong beliefs, and a very domineering father that made sure that those beliefs were practiced. But she had a Buddhist maid who she got to, 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 to know and to like very much. And the Buddhist maid had, you know, even though Buddhism came out of Hinduism, there, there's different ways that they think about the world. And so she had this Buddhist maid that would talk to her about some of those beliefs. And then she was going to a Christian school and the views of the young children she was going to school with, yeah, were so at conflict with, with Hindu and Buddhist kind of views of, of the universe and the visit to the planet and all that stuff. And, you know, so she was getting, um, a lot of conflicting signals that, that really had to do not just with her life in the here and now, but also, you know, her life in the hereafter, so to speak. And at the Christian school, when they learned about what she was, I mean, they really laid a lot of guilt trips on her. You're for sure going to hell. You don't go to church every Sunday and blah, blah, blah. You know, so she was, she lays that background out that she, she was, really a conflicted person and that continued into her adulthood um, and she said that uh, after losing two friends to cancer and a diagnosis of lymphoma she began to study everything she could about holistic health in western and eastern healing systems um, and she attributes to her eventual diagnosis with lymphoma to all this 
the stress, you know, the nocebo kind of things that she had lived with and was continuing to live with. She, she elaborates on that as she goes along. Um, when none of these systems work, she traveled to India. So she decided she'd go back to India and follow the healing system of Ayurveda. And she did that. She went back there, I think for six months, may have been longer, six months to a year. She worked with, with a guru there. And, uh, you know, he told her, he said, you know, cancer's in your head. Cancer's, a, that was one of the things I remember for these, cancer's in your head. It has to do with, with complex relationships with the environment, blah, blah, blah. And it, it, big parts in here. So he, he was trying to set, get her centered um, psychologically, get her centered spiritually, get her centered physically. And the physical had to do with, with the foods that he had her eating and so forth. But, you know, when she finally left there, she was, she was feeling fine. There was no indication of the, of the lymphoma. She was good. She went back to Hong Kong where friends told her she looked fabulous. She said, what do, what have you been doing? That's amazing. You look great. When she told them about her Ayurvedic regime, again, she got the fear and guilt, guilt kind of laid on her, you know, all these fear bait. And the kind of, I guess you would say, maybe Western approach to, well, that, you know, there's no science to say that that heals cancer. And, and so <clears throat> that really put her back into a tailspin. Um, she began then experimenting with other ways of healing. She attempted traditional Chinese medicine, uh, common in Hong Kong, but because of its conflict with Ayurveda, she was again quite confused. In traditional Chinese medicine, you're encouraged to eat meat, especially pork. In Ayurveda, you're encouraged to be vegetarian. Meat is the worst thing you can eat. So again, you can see this poor person is just so, so conflicted and um, so in the end, her organ systems failed. She slipped into a coma, death imminent. That's when she had the, the near death experience and that changed her life. Um, her father had died and she met her father in this near death experience. All the, the pressure that he had put on her and all that had been she had experienced as part of, of this early upbringing was gone. It was just unconditional love um, between her and her father. And she talks about that, how, uh, how amazing that, that was. And then as she said, you know, when she, when she, after that experience and during that experience, when she realized that heaven is a state, and I think that so much. I think we're in a dimension of it right now. When she realized that, she decided to, it's, it's where you are, heaven and hell and all the gods, as Joseph Campbell used to say. Oh, they're right here. They're not out there somewhere. When she realized that, she decided to come back. But she was a different person then. She said, after years of trying to meet everyone else's expectations, she realized as a result of this experience, she alone held the power to heal herself physically and spiritually, but it took dying basically. So then you think, and that's the very last section that I go into uh, different ways that we might actually, uh, when I reflect on my life, die to a way that you were. And maybe as you said from the beginning, Stephen, I just so appreciate those comments that maybe as you age, may maybe you can, wake up, huh? that you can wake up to, to not only the wisdom of your own body physically, but spiritually as well, huh? that it's unique, it's in each one of us. And then how do we get into that, Steve? And, and lose your fear of fear, lose your fear of dying, lose your fear of social ostracism, to develop more of a tolerance for people's idiocies and, and and counter beliefs that are totally dysfunctional for you and for them, but to allow them to have those beliefs, even if you know you you understand that it's all imaginary on their part, 
and that they're suffering the same thing that you were suffering before you lost your fear. Just amen to everything, everything you just said. You know, I, I think that's right. Huh? I, I, yeah, I so feel that so strongly. Oh, so and when I look at this COVID situation, I see people <laughs> both sides going overboard. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's fear both ways, yeah. Yes, it's so sad. It yeah. is, honest to goodness, and that's what winds us back to the pandemic and obesity. You know, that's right. I, I think that same thing. And sometimes now, you know, and we obviously, or I say obviously, I, I'm assuming, but I, I know people that are on both extremes, right? I, I know people that are, are absolutely out there on both extremes, and anymore, I don't say too much one way or the other. It's just kind of interesting to, to observe it, to to observe it, and uh, not not in the sense that you you've been saying not not judge it, not not, um, but just observe and and try to have good chats with people on both sides about it, and try to in a way uh, lighten up about the whole thing on both. But boy. Talk about extremes, huh? My goodness, it's it's just it's amazing. It's amazing. polarizing. Absolutely, absolutely. And then trying to find your center, huh? Uh, that's that transcends that. Like this, you know, mask of eternity and pairs of opposites in this last set. Find your center and hold on to that uh, amidst the the craziness of, of it all, huh? Finding your center, and uh, I, I so much b believe that and on the value of that. Um, but Anita's story is really, I think, there's a long story that goes with how I ended up on that book. And I, I for the sake of time, I won't tell it, but it's, it has to do with those, with all those connections, you know? And uh, it, it's amazing. On the one hand, you see how chance can play a role. And then on another hand, you think there really are no coincidences, huh? <laughs> Some things happen that just, um, that just, that just take you back. They, they really, they take you back and they make you think there, there's levels of connection that, um, that are just amazing. I, I will tell this story here just briefly. I won't, but it's so amazing to me. So I was writing this section of the book and I was thinking, how, what's a good way to end this section, to pull this whole thing together on the physical and the spiritual and all the rest. And at that time, we had had this book on shepherding. Come, it, it had been published and Acres USA published it. And they asked if I'd come back and just give a talk there at their meetings and then do a book signing. So I said, sure, I'll do that. And I went there and I, it was in Pittsburgh. It was at Christmas time. And I remember the lights of, of that, the football state, Three River Stadium and the river and stuff. It's beautiful, really peaceful time. So I gave the talk first thing in the morning. And you know how people will come up when you, when you give a talk, come up to talk to you. So people came up and one, one of the first people was a, a lady named Margaret. And she was a microbiologist, PhD microbiologist. And so we talked a bit. And then there was a, another one came, Frank. He was a physicist who was retired now. He's a PhD physicist who had been retired. So I talked with him a minute. And then I started talking with some other people. And out of the corner of my ear, I hear Frank and Margaret talking about near-death experiences, that they had both died. And I think, I'm first amazed. How, how do you start talking about that? I guess maybe because they both, but you know, at a conference, it's not even near talking about that. Here they're talking about it. So very quickly break off and say, I've read about these since I was in high school. And I've just been so amazed, but I've never had a chance to talk to anybody that, that had them. Would you two mind to do that? And they said, sure. So we said, well, let's meet tonight here in this room. We'll get in the back of the room and we'll talk. And so we did that. And um, Frank went first and he told his story of what had happened to him. He's in the Coast Guard. He was sick. He was being forced to swim underwater. And then all of a sudden he's looking down on himself and he tells this amazing near-death experience. 
And so we talked about that and then Margaret told her story. And, uh, and again, it was equally interesting and amazing, but what stood out was she said, okay, all of you asked me this, so I'm gonna tell you the rest of the story. And she said, I've been reincarnated time after time after time. And that's what's been most interesting to me about this journey is to link back into those reincarnations. And so she started talking about that and it was getting dark and later and Frank and his wife needed to leave and Margaret and I continued to talk and talk and talk. And then she said some things that really started to blow me out of the water. She said, you know, I drove from Chicago to this meeting to listen to uh, Sally Fallon talk. I didn't come to listen to you talk. And she said, but I was walking down that hall to go to Sally's talk. And it was like I was sucked into, drawn into this room. And, and then of course, the, the, the other stuff. And I have to say, I'm totally open to all these kind of things. I, I, I just believe this. And so, um, so we parted company and she went back to Pittsburgh and she was supposed to go to Wisconsin with her family that weekend. And she said, I couldn't go. I needed to just meditate. And so she did that on the Sunday. And then she wrote me this long, long letter. And she said, you know, I knew you in an earlier life. And she said, you got me killed in that life. <laughs> and she said, here's how it was. I was a scribe in a monastery back in the 14, 1500s, whenever it was. And she said, you weren't a monk there. You came to me and you asked me if I would transcribe some documents for you. And I said, uh, she said, uh, I would. He, she was a he in that life, of course. And so she said, she's in this monastery and she's at night she would transcribe and she said that it was so interesting reading the documents that you brought me but and she said at first when i would was telling the monks about them they thought they were really interesting too but the further on it went they weren't finding what i was telling them interesting at all and she said here's why it was the gnostic gospels you had brought me the gnostic gospels to transcribe and as that went on, that was an affront to their beliefs. So she said, at that point. Uh, heresy. Heresy, absolutely. I was far enough along. They, they no longer wanted me as a scribe in that monastery. And they made me leave. And I left this night. And I didn't know where to go in town, whatever. And she said, I ended up being killed. So we knew each other in an earlier life. And in a way, you had me killed. But that's how... And so we corresponded um, for a long time, still are, but she started sending me, she said, you know, there's four books I think are really interesting on reincarnation. And she said, read these books. And so I, I did, and they were amazing. And, um, and one of them was this book by Anita. So there I gave you the whole long story, but it gets you thinking you know, how much, I, in my own beliefs, I think, how much do I block off because I've been trained in a certain way, huh? So you're a, you think you're a scientist, you're not, but you, you're trained in this way and you need data and all this stuff. And yet it's so much more than that. And so that gets me thinking so much about those kind of things, you know, and, and thinking how, you know, how do you, transcend all of that in, in a way and, and open up to be open to all of that, huh? that, that you probably really don't know a anything. And so it's more about the conversation as I started it opened up to you today at the very first to me writing the book and all that was more about the, just the conversation than, than any kind of dogmatic sort of thing. So I'm um, about reincarnation. Um... There's a book called Journey of Souls that really made an impression on me, and I posted uh, the link in the chat. Okay, Meryl, you're, I'm going to have to get that book. I, I love it. <clears throat> I've got your email. I'll send okay, it to you. Okay, do, because my, my memory to be able to remember anything right now is gone. <laughs> so It's so, being archived for your benefit. 
Okay, perfect. Uh, perfect. That's, I, 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 I like that comment that you were talking about with transcendence because it's very, very difficult to transcend anything that you take for granted. It is. It honestly is. And, and how easy it is to do that. Huh? I, I'm saying this is soul searching for me, me. Um, not, not, for, not as a discussion for any of you. It's just, ah, and you become aware of that. Huh? I think you become, and probably that's part of aging too, Steve. Huh? I, and near death experiences and right. any kind of transformative process, ending up face down in the gutter because of a drug addiction. Anything so, like that can, can change your perception of reality and make you aware of something that before, um, it was you were oblivious to it. We need to do the last section today too. Actually, you know, if you're up, because it's so. That's so. We're just so on the same same page. That's exactly where that last section goes. You know, a absolutely. You summed it up. So I guess if you don't want to go there, <laughs> but that's it, it, so absolutely. I I just really think that a lot. I think that all the time. And that now I wonder as a species, may, maybe that's what's happening to us as a species in a sense, huh? As a whole entire species, maybe that, that, that transformative kind of uh, process. We have a fossil fuel addiction. We're gonna end up in the gutter pretty quick if we don't change our tune. Ah, no kidding, Mary. no kidding, no kidding. Yeah, I don't think of it as a fossil fuel addiction. Yeah, I mean, I, I would look at it as, for example, um, authoritarianism addiction or insecurity. Um, you know, how do you... You can, you can call it the dominator culture. And if we didn't live in a dominator culture, likely we could deal with fossil fuels without, you know, going overboard. Yeah, or we could, uh, you know, end up with enough cheap power to use all the fossil fuels for building um, clothing and shelters and, and uh, you know, structures and things like that, you know, in a sense, sequester all of our carbon in, 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 uh, in structure. But um, well, the issue is more about humans and what, what it means to be human in ways in which are essential to our survival, or at least were at some point in the past essential to our survival. And therefore, we're like fish in the water and go, what are you talking about water? Yeah, what right. water? <laughs> yeah, uh, absolutely, huh? absolutely the case. <clears throat> yeah, such good comments, such good comments. I'll, I'll not say, I could would link to both of you right now, but I'll since I told that long Margaret story, I'll keep, I'll go. Uh, you know, like Nietzsche said, there's more wisdom in your body than in your deepest philosophies. Less and less do you need to force things until finally you arrive at non-action. When nothing is done, nothing is left undone. Nothing is done because the doer has wholeheartedly vanished into the deed. I often think about that. You know. The singer becomes the song, the, the individual becomes the physical and spiritual manifestation, however a person wa would want to look at that. So that would bring us then to this last section of fading into, into mystery. And if you want to go for it, I'm willing to go for it too. <laughs> we're this, far, far, in, we're yeah. this far, far into it, huh? We go, go give it a last shot. I, I'm a little bit worried about the Zoom issue and whether or not um, the Zoom recording is going to be beyond our... It story. looks like it might have stopped. Did it stop? No, no it's, it's still okay. recording on my end, but, um, you know, oh, yeah. okay. it's up at two or two and a half hours and we're now... Um, <laughs> we're beyond five, five hours. hours. And I know when we had two recordings on, it was beyond our limit. And so um, I just don't know what Zoom might do to us. <laughs> I think some of it might be cut off because it's, blink I don't know if it's normally blinking, but it's doing funny things from this end. Yeah, it's, norm it's blinking here, which means it is recording. And Well, and what we could do is just do another Zoom <laughs> and just sort of you know, do the last part and just add it. Yeah. That's well, why, don't we, why don't we finish this today and then maybe go back and do the last part? I was thinking of doing it right now. 
but okay, because I don't know if we're recording. Oh, you mean start it up again? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if we're yeah. recording. Well, the problem with that is that we need to distribute the new um, uh, invitation to everybody, and that probably okay. isn't that easy. That I don't know. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, I could what make a, I could make a session. I could maybe cut and paste it into the chat, and people could copy it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, let's just go because it's already stopped if it's right. stopped. Okay. And okay. then we can do it again if we need to. Okay. <laughs> yes, and I'm happy. However, however okay. you warp okay. speed, Fred. Warp okay. speed. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So as I started this, uh, our conversation today, talking about the backwoods and, and what a meditation it was, it, it struck me so much after, you know, you start off as a young child. And for me, everything was so amazing in the, in the world. It, it really was. When I thought of the natural world, I, I was just mesmerized by, by that world. Um, and then you get busy with jobs and career and everything and and so forth. But when we moved back to the backwoods and all that let go of that, it was like becoming a child again. It really was. And, and there was time just to stop and to enjoy the day and all the creatures that were there and then the night, the night and so forth. And it, it, it struck me very much that... I felt anyway, we are in a dimension of heaven. It's not somewhere else, it's, it's here. It's amazing, this. this. And I, when I reflected on the science, I thought, you know, all that research we did and learning about plants and animals and all that, what it did to me was just open up to me, what a miracle this is, the levels of complexity and interconnectedness. I just was became kind of childlike again. So it was really a time for reflection and thinking about those things. And when I later on read Anita's book, I thought, yeah, boy, I can relate to that, what she said on heaven being a state, not a, not a place. And, and that we create that in our life, in our own life and our associations with others. And like Joe Campbell used to heaven and hell and all the gods, they're right, they're right here. We, we, we create all that, that business. So um, I, I reflected a lot on that. I also reflected on this guy here, Aldo Leopold. And, you know, if you come up through a natural resources training like I did, he's really, he's really kind of the, the godfather of so much of that. He is so re respected and his books like A Sand County Almanac are so important a part of that. And I used to think about, you know, he, he began a sand county almanac with this statement. There are some who can live without wild things and some who cannot. These essays are the delights and dilemmas of one who cannot. He went on to say, we abuse land because we guard it as a commodity belonging to us. When we see land as a community to which we belong, we may begin to use it with love and respect. You know, his book was, was such a fervent account, um, so heartfelt, I think, of the beauty and wonder of nature, and then the last section of how our detachment from, how our detachment from nature is wreaking havoc on the communities we inhabit. Um, you know, and he wrote that back in the 40s. I mean, if he thought it was bad then, some of the things he wrote about, he, he wouldn't even... He, he, he wouldn't believe nowadays what, what, what's gone. And despite the eloquent pleas in that book, as he called it, the company has not gotten back into step. Uh, indeed, the changes um, fossil fuel-based mechanized humans have fashioned since his death are, you know, they're nothing short of, of breathtaking. A mere 12,000 years before Le Leopold's visit to Earth, uh, changing climates, aboriginal overkill led to the extinction of 40 species of mammals in North America. It's common knowledge now, I think, and well accepted scientifically, we're participating in the sixth mass extinction. And for the first time in 200,000 years, we could be on the brink of ex extinction ourselves. Um, you know, in a very real sense, it seems like we're 
seemingly inexorably being consumed by changes we've wrought and consequences that, that no, no one really foresaw. I often think though, you know, no beginning, no end as we talked early on and change perhaps existence is forever in the process consuming itself. What seemed to be births and deaths, you know, is really simply an endless transformation. And our visit to earth is, is a fleeting uh, manifestation and, and such a wonderful chance to, to experience life here as a, as a human being. I often think how interesting it would be to, to be any other creature or even another human being. If you could be another human being for five minutes and just experience the way they look at the world, how would that change you? Or if you could be a chicken for five minutes or a plant. Because um, we, 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 we speculate on what it's like and what, what the experience is, but I, we can never know, I think, without actually having having that experience. And at this point, and this is kind of for you, Steve, in a way, too, with what you've been saying, I often think of this fellow here in an essay that he wrote titled on an apparent intention in the fate of the individual. <laughs> and he points out um, that when we've reached an advanced age and we look back over our life, it can seem to have had a consistent order and plan as though composed by some novelist and events that when they'd occurred seemed accidental and of little moment turn out to be indispensable factors in the composition of a consistent plot. And I know every one of you, if you just think back over your life, you'll think of branching points, bifurcation points where you didn't have a clue where that would lead, but it became so important in wh where your life went. I, I, and I won't tell the stories here, but I think of that so much. You think, is it chance? Was it coincidence? Or was that all that a part of the unfolding? So Schopenhauer asks, who composed the plot? He suggests that just our dream, as our dreams are composed by an aspect of ourself of which our consciousness is unaware, so too our whole life. And just as people whom we will have met, apparently by mere chance, like Margaret, became leading agents in the structuring of our life, so too we will have served unknowingly as agents giving meaning to the lives of others. The whole thing blends together like one grand symphony with everything unconsciously in this sense structuring everything else. He concludes, it is though our lives are the features of a great dream of a single dreamer in which all the dream characters dream too. Everything links to everything else moved out of the will to life, which is the universal will in nature. To me, it's a marvelous essay. And I often um, reflect on, on, on what he said in that essay. Yeah, and uh, I think I would, I would ask the question, you know, is it really that um, externalization of the human experience to God, or is it really more about the spinning out, the unfolding of each person, starting with genetics and gestation, and then all the other aspects of being human, where so much of the richness of our life is coming from our subconscious and unconscious minds that where there's guidance taking place, but <laughs> we're oblivious to it. Hey, hey man, I, I think that's exactly right. Huh? There's guidance taking place, but we're oblivious. And sometimes I've, I often thought <clears throat> when I was working on it, I'd become a cosmic voyager with amnesia and the trials are what waked me up then, you know? I mean, because like you said, you know, I, I'm just relating so much to what, to what you just said in that sense, you know? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I, uh, many years ago, I must be 30 years now, maybe this, this book was published a long time ago. Um, and it, it, again, it's relating to where you're, <laughs> where we're, we're going on this stuff. But um, Paul Bronson wrote this book, The True Story of People Who Answered the Ultimate 
question, what should I do with my life? And he points out in the introduction, he says, we're all writing the story of our life. Um, the unfolding, what you just were saying, huh, Steve? Um, we want to know what it's, quote, about, what are the themes and which theme is on the rise. We want to know where we're headed, not to spoil our own ending by ruining the surprise, but we want to ensure that when the ending comes, it won't be shallow. We will have done something. We will have not squat. We will not have squandered our visit to Earth. So he began the book when he hit, as we've been talking, he hit a low point in his life. Television show he'd been writing for was canceled. Magazines he wrote for were thinning their pages. Um, his book editor had quit to pursue theater and film. He was out of work, and uh, <clears throat> he and his wife had a baby, their first on, on its way. And he was worried how to be a good father, um, how to make money to support his family, and, and how to keep going as a writer. So looking for guidance, what he decided to do was to, he was intrigued by people who had found their calling. And what was it that, that they had discovered through that process? Those who had overcome, as he said, the seduction of money, power, and prestige, those who broke away from the chorus to learn the sound of their own voice, to go inward. Um, as he points out, he said, I had, I had no credentials as a counselor or an academic. The advance, the advance of his life had shredded any theories he had about how to address the question, what should I do with my life? As you say, absolutely down and out, right? Uh, he'd been humbled into admitting that he knew nothing. As he hit the road, he was continuously humbled by what the over 900 people he interviewed had endured and the wisdom that came out of that. Um, and what did he learn? He learned that it was the hard times that changed people's lives. In the good times, they frequently talked about change. Hard times forced them to overcome the doubts that normally gave them pause. In the end, they spoke about fulfillment, not happiness. They often found fulfillment in living up to their moral responsibility to society finding some ways to feel they were helping others or at least genuinely connected to others. And even though they were pursuing what they personally needed, they were learning selflessness. So as we've been saying, trials can and do transform individual consciousness. Um, in his book, Dirt to Soil, One Family's Journey into Regenerative Agriculture, Gabe Brown talks about that he would have never gotten into ag regenerative ag and those approaches had he not been just absolutely down and out, absolutely down and out. In Call of the Reed Warbler, uh, A New Agriculture, A New Earth, Charlie Massey talks about those same things. And he talks about the people that he, what he does is to interview many people um, throughout the course of that book. He tells, he tells their stories. In every case, they, they had the experience that Paul Bronson was talking about. In the, in the industrial agriculture that they were trying to do, they became broke ecologically, economically, socially, physically, spiritually. They were just absolutely beaten down. It caused a transformation that led them into this, this regenerative kind of ag. And so, what I often wonder is, can trials that are happening to us now as a, in this country and as a species across the globe, um, will, will that transform the collective consciousness of humanity to nourish one another and, and life on this planet? I guess we'll see what happens, but um, you know, that's certainly what, what many people are, are involved with. I'm going to, to kind of quickly, but just to tell the story, you know, three things happened to me as I look back in my lifetime. Um, there, I have a friend who says we, we should repot ourselves. Every 10 years, we should repot ourselves. We should be re repot ourselves. When I look back over my life, 
I got repotted every 10 years, it seems like, you know, I didn't volunteer for most of those repottings, but I got, got, and the, one of those uh, was back in the late eighties, early nineties. And, you know, I had never, ever been depressed. I, I was happy go lucky. Um, just a very enjoying positive, um, but this depression came on me. I, I really, you know, looking back on it, I don't know how it started for sure. Um, it's a little bit of a mystery, all, all of it still to me. But for five years, I was so depressed, I, I had to look up to see a worm, basically. I, I was just absolutely down and out. You know, last summer, I listened to a TED Talk by a friend and colleague. His name's Ian Gordon in Australia. I met him 30 years ago at a NATO conference in Wales, and he was talking about his son's suicide, Callan, uh, at 28 years of age. And Ian's talk brought back so many memories for me. Though my wife Sue and I had never lost a child, I suffered from depression. And when Ian and I first met 30 years ago in Wales, I was beginning my descent into, into depression. Um, I often contemplated suicide, and I'm not sure why I never did that. Although I think it was that I had a wife and two young kids, and it helped to tip the balance away from, from, from suicide. I was hanging by a thread in those years. It was such a, uh, an unfamiliar scape, thoughtscape. So when Ian talked about the choice to stay alive over the long days and months and years, he was talking about his son and that that was a choice. Uh, I could relate to that. And when he talked about how much it took just to get up each day to face the world, I could relate to that too. Um, both from the standpoint of those five years of depression and then a decade later from cancer. At that point in life, I was running as fast as I could run. Um, and then I was diagnosed with cancer. Sue and I were as close to divorce as we'd ever come. And so it was a huge effort just to get up each day, let alone to go to work and face the world. Ian concludes though, he said that life should not be defined by the day a person took their life, but by each day that person chose to live for family and friends. And the story that Ian told put up such a, <clears throat> that told that so poignantly within the context of Callan's beautiful life. So, you know, during my depression, we, we went to Australia um, during the depths of that depression, spent a year there. And it was amazing to me what I thought about when we got to Australia. We were doing lots of research in the U.S. and I uh, was receiving a lot of, of praise. And I thought that's what we, it was about. But when we got to Australia, that wasn't what I missed at all. What I thought about were the people I was working with. And I thought, you know, every good thing that's happening in our program is a result of those relationships, those loving, nurturing relationships with one another, that creativity was flowing out of those relationships. And that's what struck me. I never looked at things the same after that. It was the relationships that I thought about. And I, when I read Lauren Lasha, Lawrence Lachan's How to Meditate, and he talked about the meaning and validity of our lives are given by that part of us that relates to the world of the one. The mechanics and techniques by means of which we live our lives are given by that part of us that relates to the world of the many. It is the one that gives meaning to the many and the many that gives form to the one. It is relationships that make identity meaning, real and meaningful as it is identity that makes relationships possible. It's only when we have access to both parts of our being that we can remember the meaning of our own existence. Uh, I thought very much about, about that. And when I left for Australia, I knew I was down and out like Paul Bronson I, and I was grasping at threads and there was a an editor that I worked with at the Ag Experiment Station in those days and uh, 
he was a very cynical guy. I liked him a lot. I loved his cyn cynicism. And, and, and the day before we left for Australia, I was over talking with him. And he said, and excuse the French here, he said, you're a sick bastard. Why don't you take this and read it? And I said, yeah, yes, you're right. I am. I'll do anything. And it, what he gave me was Joe Campbell's The Power of Myth, the Campbell Moyer Power of Myth. And I started reading that when we got to Australia. My wife and I were reading that aloud. And it's like, wow, this is amazing. This, this is what I've thought about my whole life. But in the tradition I was brought up with, we never talked about these kind of things. I was conceived, born and raised a Roman Catholic. And I appreciate that, what that, but it was like all these things I wondered about, we never talked about. And, and that just came so alive for me in reading that. And then when I was reading The World's Religions by Houston Smith and thinking about those, I thought, you know, I'm all of these traditions and I'm none of the, these traditions. They're, 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 the mythologies are, to me, were reminders of why we came to visit Earth and helped me to tap into that. I often thought, after that, I'd become a cosmic voyager with amnesia. I'd been confusing what I was doing all along with what I'd come to learn. I was by being reminded in my, my way of understanding this, why, why I'd visited Earth. After that, I never taught a class the same way. I never did anything the same way. And I will spare you the examples there. But it was profound what it did for me and my relationship with students and how I, how I interacted in courses, um, every facet was changed as a result of that. And I think in a, in, in a, in a much, much better, more, more uh, holistic, I guess we would say, just it, it totally changed, changed me. Well, a decade later, you'd think I would be, I'd be okay, but a decade later, <laughs> I, uh, I was diagnosed with, with cancer. And uh, again, I was running as fast as you could run uh, at work and research. And, uh, but I ended up um, I wasn't feeling well for a year, not, not terrible, but not well. And I didn't ignore it. I went, I went to, to doctors and tried to find out what was up. And I really didn't until I hit one, one doctor. And, and anyway, he, he did some recommended and did some things that said, look, you, you, better, you better have these tests done and let's see what's what. So I did, and that was in the fall of the year. And I, colonoscopy was one of the tests. And they called me the Monday before Thanksgiving. To, they said, you need to come in. And you know when they call you, they're not going to tell you that your colon looks great, right? They don't call you in to tell you that. So, so I went in there. And this shows how, you know, to me, how, how in a way foolish I was. And, and so caught up in the work again. And... Uh, <clears throat> So the doctor was, was, we went to the doctor's office the day before Thanksgiving and he was showing us these photographs of, of cancer. And he said, you know, this is very serious. Um, he said, I'm gonna get a second opinion from the University of Utah, but th this is really serious stuff. And I'm hearing the words and I'm, I'm stunned. I never felt more alive actually than when I had cancer in that sense, because you know that death is really close to you too. And so I was listening to him, but I'm thinking, you know, and he mentioned surgery and I'm thinking, well, there's no way I can come in for surgery for at least three, four months till spring break. I'm too busy. I got too much going on. <laughs> And you realize you never have those times when you're so thankful you didn't say what you were thinking. That was one of those times because I would have just looked like the fool that I was to say that because it was became clear you're going to have surgery immediately. And so I said, had the surgery in a 
you know, a week after, after that, I was in surgery and I was in the hospital and it was Christmas time. And, um, you know, I just remember it, it so stopped me in my tracks, all of it. And this peace came over me, this incredible, incredible peace came over me. I, I would lay there at night after I'd had the surgery and it was quiet and the lights of the Christmas trees would shine into the room. And as I say, this, this incredible peace came, came over me. It was a peace that transcended anything I had ever experienced before. And it was a peace that, that if I tried to put it in words, it was like everything is going to be just fine in your life. Now, uh, in the biggest picture, there's nothing that you have to fear. You're talking about the fears. And there's nothing that you have to fear. Everything is going to be uh, it was so calming. It, it was just so calming and centering, and that lasted for a long time time with me. Um, and then I had a colleague, a friend and colleague, who was diagnosed with cancer at that time. And when I went back to work, she, her name was Mary Lou. She came and talked to me, and and she said, you know, I've been diagnosed with cancer too. And at that time, we were both very raw with that, knowing that if they didn't get all the cancer, you're not here for very long, basically. And so Mary Lou was telling me, and she said, but I think they, I think they got the cancer. But in her case, they didn't get the cancer, and she, she, she died a, a year, a year later. And um, I went to, to her funeral. It was the most moving funeral I think I've ever, ever been to. People got up and talked about their relationship with Mary Lou, and it made it, you realize how important relationships are. Her son got up and talked about the love of a mother for the child and the child for the mother. Everyone was crying. We were all crying. Uh, and her friends got up and talked about the last days with her where they would sit in the backyard holding hands, looking at the beauty of nature. and. Uh, it was just incredibly moving. And then um, her brother-in-law got up and was talking about, about the experience. And he told a story about uh, a butterfly morphing from the cocoon into the butterfly. And he said, there was a man that watched this happening and this, this butterfly was struggling in the early stage. He said, well, I'll help it. I'll simply cut this cocoon open. And then he said, you know what happened? The butterfly never developed. You need that struggle, that trial to do it. So he really captured that. And then the last person that I wondered to talk was her husband. He got up and it was very short. Um, he thanked everyone for coming and then um, he said, you know, throughout this, this uh, experience with Mary Lou, what we've gone through, uh, we've experienced every emotion that a human being ca can experience from fear and anger and regret and why me and all of those sort of things. But he said, you know, as we've gone on and on and on in this process, in the end, by the time that Mary Lou died, there was only one sentiment that was left. There was only one emotion that was left in, in either one of us. And you know what that emotion was? It was love. It was love. That's all that we'd experienced. And so throughout all of that, I was reminded of the power of love and compassion. And it seemed to me all beings on earth were all family. I often thought and used to say life is a stage, for me anyway, upon which the challenge to learn to love one another plays out, no matter one's vocation is what, what was striking me in those days. And I used to say all the time in my mind, teach me to love, teach me to love, teach me to love. And the challenges that I faced in that next decade were really that stage helped me to be prepared for the, the next stage. And then the last that I'll share with you, um, you know, was letting go, retiring from Utah State University. I could have still been there. And I was at a point where the going was easy and it was interesting. But after the two earlier experiences, I thought I'm going to grow more if I leave here. If I go through that trial of leaving Utah State University, 
and going to the backwoods where nobody knows me, nobody could care less who I am or, or anything like that. I just had a feeling I'll learn more from doing that. And so that, that was, um, I, I did choose that one that, that it, it would be good. Now, I want to tell you uh, a story here that was published in the Atlantic about a year ago, and it, it was written by Arthur Brooks. And it was an essay titled, Your Professional Decline is Coming Much Sooner Than You Think. Um, and he begins like this. He's, he's on a plane ride from Los Angeles to Washington, D.C. It's late at night, it's on the plane, and he's at the very back of the plane, and he hears this, there's a lady and a man behind him, and he hears the lady says, say this, quote, it's not true that no one needs you anymore. Um, and a man Brooks assumed was her husband murmured, I wish I was dead. Again, the woman says, oh, stop saying that. Please stop saying that. So he says, yeah, he listened with morbid, morbid fascination uh, to this conversation as they went across the country. He said, I imagine someone who had worked in relative obscurity, perhaps, someone with unfulfilled dreams, perhaps of the degree he never attained, the career he never pursued, the company he never started. Um, at the end of the flight, the light switched on. Brooks finally got to look at the, this, what he thought was this desolate old man, and he said he was shocked. He recognized him. He was and still is a world-famous man. Then in his mid-80s, he was beloved as a hero for his courage, patriotism, and accomplishments many decades earlier. Um, as he walked up the aisle of the plane, passengers greeted him with veneration. Standing at the door of the cockpit, the pilot stopped him and said, Sir, I've admired you since I was a little boy. The old man, wishing for death just a few minutes earlier, beamed with pride at the recognition of his past glories. For selfish reasons, Brooks couldn't get the cognitive dissonance of that scene out of his mind. It was the summer of 2015, shortly before his 51st birthday. He wasn't world famous like the man on the plane, but his professional life was going well. He was the president of a flourishing Washington think tank, the American Enterprise Institute. He'd written some best-selling books. People came to his talks. His columns were published in the New York Times. But he started to wonder, can I really keep going at this pace? I work like a maniac, even if I stayed at it 12 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, at some point, my career would slow and stop. And when it did, what then? Would I one day be looking back wistfully and wishing I were dead? Was there anything I could do starting now to give myself a shot at avoiding misery and maybe even achieve happiness when the music inevitably stopped? So he goes on to talk about the four stages of life according to, a Hindu, according to Hindu thinking. The first stage is youth and young adulthood uh, devoted to learning. The second, which is dedicated to achievement, is the time when a person builds a career, accumulates wealth, and creates a family. During this stage, we find one of life's most common traps, especially in the United States nowadays. We, come a, be, we become attached to earthly rewards, money, power, prestige, on and on and on. And some try to make this stage last a lifetime. This is especially the case nowadays when we measure worth by what we do, by our achievements, rather than, than what, we, what we are. The anecdote, uh, anecdote to these temptations is the third, third stage, going, in to the, going into the forest. This is a stage, usually starting around age 50, when we focus less on professional ambition and achievements and become more devoted to spirituality, service, and wisdom. This doesn't mean we stop working when we turn 50, something few people can nowadays afford to do, only that our life goals should begin to transform. The third stage is a time for study and training in preparation for the last stage of our life. Um, which should be dedicated 
to gaining the fruits of enlightenment. Even if sitting in a cage at the age of 75 isn't your ambition, the point should still be clear. As we age, we should resist the allure of success and focus on transcendentally important matters related to our eminent exodus from this planet. Returning to the famous man on the plane, he failed to leave stage two. He was addicted to the rewards of the world. His self-worth was still anchored in his memories of professional successes many decades earlier. His ongoing recognition purely an offshoot of his by now long lost skills. Any glory today was a mere shadow of his past glories. Meanwhile, he'd completely skipped the spiritual development of stage three and was now missing out on the bliss of stage four. I often think of what I'm going to say next <clears throat> that happened to me many, many years ago as well. And it had to do with Edwin R. Murrow. And from 1951 to 1955, Murrow was the host of a radio talk show titled This I Believe. The book he wrote about that program was about the personal philosophies of 100 thoughtful men and, and women. And I remember um, NPR was starting a program related to this. And I was on the way back from the airport at night from Salt Lake City driving to Logan, and they were replaying some of the episodes that uh, Merle had. And it, it was amazing to listen to the people tell their, their stories in five minutes. But the most powerful story I heard that, that night was from a man, and I'm paraphrasing here what I remember, he said, I can tell you what I've been taught to believe about my family, my community, religion, politics, nation, and so forth. But to be honest with you, I cannot tell you what I believe independent of all I've been taught to believe. Uh, and I thought, you know, this guy really gets, gets it. And he gets what we've been talking about. Um, you know, we... We identify with our family, our community, our culture, religion, job, politics, and country, and so on, all of the I am's. But I often think now that's a trap momentarily inflected in time and space during our visit. Um, I'm not a Hindu, a Buddhist, a Taoist, a Muslim, or a Christian. I'm all those beliefs rolled into one, and at the same time, I've None of, I'm none of those beliefs. I often think when we transcend all of the I am's is when we finally come to I am. And as we were talking earlier, this idea of coming to the center, of finding the center uh, physically, spiritually. And as it's in the Tao, the Tao doesn't take sides. It gives birth to both good and evil. The master doesn't take sides. She welcomes both saints and sinners. Hold on to, to the center. And this marvelous statue that Joseph Campbell talks about, the mask of eternity, the center, and the pairs of opposites that, that can be inflected so easily here on this planet. And then the idea of finding a, our center. And, you know, if you know of this system, the chakras and so forth, and Moving beyond the lower chakras, the root, the sacral, and the solar plexus to the heart chakra, the, 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 where the love, the, the notion of love and, trans, and transcendence, and then moving, moving in these levels that, that um, we were just talking about from the throat to the third eye to the crown chakra of, of transcending and a spiritual awakening in, in all those senses. So I think of that a lot and I often wonder what will become of Homo sapiens? No question, you know, no one knows the answer to that question. Um, we, we, we'll see as, as we were talking, but at this moment on this planet, I think the question isn't if life will continue in the Garden of Eden, the question is if we Homo sapiens will continue to live uh, in the Garden of, of Eden. 
And I know there's different views on this, and many of the people that I interact with nowadays are very, very hopeful that, that we can stay as a species on the planet, you know, that that, that, that would be very hopeful. We talk about that. But then I know of these different views, like Houston Smith writes of the Hindu view of, of a visit to this planet, also talk of social progress, cleaning up the world, of creating the kingdom of heaven on earth. In short, all dreams of utopia are not just doomed to disappointment, they misjudge the world's purpose, which is not to rival paradise, but to provide a training ground for the human spirit. So there's and Joseph Campbell certainly echoed those words when he said, when we talk about settling the world's problems, we're barking up the, the wrong tree. The world is perfect. It's a mess. It's always been a mess. We're not going to change it. Our job is to straighten out our, our own lives. Um, and I think of, of Chinese societies and Confucius. When I, when I think of this, of this part then going back Okay, is it possible for Homo sapiens to transcend all of all of the tribalism and all of the the things and and you know continue on this this planet? I think of Confucius and and um, you know the profound Im impact that that he had, uh, beginning with one spread one self as a as a node spreading from there to include one's family, one's face-to-face -face community, including the natural environment, one's nation, and finally all of humanity, the transcending of, of the local tribal, the individual selfishness and the, and uh, you know, he taught that societies must become intri in intricately coupled with one another in the natural landscapes they inhabit. Tolerate strong checks on human values. Nations must develop managerial capacity to sustain such a system. What Ophelis talked about there at the beginning. And so we have all these connections and I'll, I'll quickly go through this and, and then we'll, that, that'll be it. But, you know, in regenerative ag now, there's this huge recognition of, of these, these linkages, soil, plant diversity, herbivore health, human health, climate, and so forth. And, um, you know, you've see, seen many of these of where, where greenhouse gas emissions are coming from in terms of fossil fuels, energy for a number of uses, and then um, <clears throat> a particular part of in us, and, uh, industry here, waste, and then ag forestry and land use, and with um, livestock and manure being roughly six six percent of that that whole circle it's there it amazes me sometimes what a huge focus there is on we've got to get rid of livestock and 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 that kind of thing on the planet when when it's it, it's not one of the the major kind of things it's the tip of the iceberg it's the tip of the iceberg huh? and as we know it, it's like everything pairs of opposites but we know that there can be some very good that can come of that if we if we manage properly. So uh, let me um, say a few words about that. And you know this idea that diets link human and environmental health certainly is important. And one of the papers I thought that was so nice when I was reviewing that literature recently was written by Tillman and Clark. And Tillman actually is a plant ecologist by training. Um, did a fabulous, fabulous plant ecology work, so well known in that literature, and now he's really written a number of uh, important papers related to diet and human health. But what they were doing, he and Clark, was looking at different diets, um, veg vegetarian diets with the, this mixture of foods, pescatarian, Mediterranean, and then what they called the omnivorous diet, which was really, you could say, the Western diet, a highly refined, highly processed diet. <clears throat> and they were looking at the impacts and projecting through this century of different diets and what they, what they might, might mean. And so they said, if we figure there'll be roughly 10 billion people on the planet by 2050, and that that could lead to 32% increase in greenhouse gas emissions, if we shift to the omnivore diet, net increase of 80% emissions, 
from food production. And they were really focusing on, on the Western diet and the highly processed diet, what that had done here in the US, and then how that was being uh, promoted around the world by, by the food industry. And he was saying, they were arguing in that paper that there would be no net increase in food production emissions if the worldwide diet became whatever combination of the Mediterranean, pescatarian, and vegetarian diets. And the Mediterranean having, having meat as a part of that. So they weren't, weren't talking about meat as, as, uh, as a horrible thing in that, that sense. They were just simply saying that if we were to eat wholesome diets, get away from, from the, the processed stuff, it could make a, a huge difference. Um, you know, Paul, Paul's book, Drawdown, where he talks of 80 ways to mitigate climate change, Food and agriculture collectively, if you <clears throat> rank number one as ways to sequester greenhouse gases from food, you know, doing away as best we could with food waste. They talk about plant diet, plant rich diets and the value of that, tropical forest, civil pastorism, regenerative ag, and so forth, and managed grazing. And the people I work with quite a lot, we we talk and interact and doing studies related to the role that managing grazing and civil pastoralism and regenerative ag can play in, in reducing greenhouse, uh, in fixing carbon in the soil and reducing emissions of methane and nitrous oxide and so forth. So, you know, I think there's a lot that agriculture can do to be part of, of the solution and certainly all of us and that's what Yvonne and Melinda uh, were here the last two times with uh, that's all they wanted to talk about is what they're doing and how we can all work together on that. You know I also think a lot about this <clears throat> most people don't own farms or ranches and here in the U.S. it's 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 not very many that do since we've gone so much the industrial ag route. Huh? It's less than two percent. But we could all be farmers and ranchers. We could all do that. Um, I've been reminded over the last year, time and again, about in World War II and the Victory Gardens in World War II. You know that individuals growing those gardens produced 45% of the food that the U.S. needed. Half of the food roughly was being produced in those victory gardens. And, um, you know, if we were to each think of that and then think about what that would mean uh, in terms of the, the lack of need for the huge industrial kinds of ways that we farm nowadays to, but to farm and ranch on more smaller scales. And that combined with, with each of us being linked in with the land again, how, how powerful that, that could be. Um, on, on our 1.5 acres where we live in Innes, th this is a view here, the head gardener who's right there is, uh, and I, we have a small lawn. It's, it's not large. It's this little piece here that was planted. Actually, this is a before we bought it picture of what it looked like. And this is an after picture. We, we've kept that. And it's, it's infested with clover so we don't have to fertilize. We use no commercial fertilizer, yet it's one of the greenest yards in the, in the area because it's infested with clover, which fixes uh, nitrogen. On most of the property, we encourage native plants. This is all native plants, grasses, forbs, and shrubs that are growing here. And it's amazing to see the beauty of them seasonally as, as they come and go, um, the ever-changing colors and shapes of a kaleidoscope. We grow vegetable, herbal, and medicinal gardens. And now, as I was saying earlier, we have chickens on the plant. Um, due to the covenants, we aren't allowed to have sheep or goats but we encourage pronghorn deer, uh, pronghorn and antelope to come and forage and fertilize, pee and poop all over the land. With electric fence, we, we protect the native shrubs that we've planted all around the perimeter, berry producing and various other kinds of shrubs so that they, the deer and pronghorn don't, don't annihilate them. Um, 
but we encourage these animals nonetheless to use our place. To our eyes, this great diversity of plants is beautiful and valuable, but I think it'll take a transformation of consciousness for many people in our neighborhood to see this as something that's beautiful. What they see as beautiful is a monoculture of Kentucky bluegrass uh, with that's that's fertilized and and uh, you know put herbicides on so there's no dandelions or anything like that on it. Um, a transformation of consciousness like I'm talking about there uh, could do away with herbicides and fertilizers people now use to weed and feed their lawns, not to mention the amount of fossil fuels and water in the arid west, which is squandered needlessly. When you look at the amount of resource that goes into um, to all of these kind of inputs, and then you look at the water, uh, residential water use outside the home is 30 to 60 percent of total water use. Depending on the estimate, 7 billion to 9 billion gallons of waters are used each day for suburban irrigation. That's not sustainable in any way out here in the West, in any of this. So, as Aldo Leopold said in San County Almanac, related to this idea. There are two spiritual dangers in not owning a farm. One is the danger of supposing that breakfast comes from the grocery and the other that heat comes from the furnace. To avoid the first danger, one should plant a garden, preferably where there's no grocer to confuse the issue. To avoid the second, you should lay a split of good oak on the andirons, preferably where there's no furnace, and let it warm his shins while a February blizzard tosses the trees outside. So I think as a culture, in some ways, not in others, but in some ways, we've made an art form out of dining, but we've tabled all these larger questions. Eating, eating is participating in endless transformation as plants and animals are killed and eaten. As I eat, the energy and matter and someone becomes this entity I call me, which will, in the flicker of a cosmic eye, return to Earth as plants and animals. And one of the essays I wrote recently was just making the point that plants are conscious and sentient as well as animals. There's such a rich literature but that's being developed along those lines nowadays. And so the point is all life is sacred and we're participating in, in, a, in a sacred act. In pondering this mystery, we may come to realize that all life is sacred. We're members of nature's communities. What we do to them, we do to ourselves only by nurturing them can we nurture ourselves? And I would say we do that by declaring love, not war, on people and the landscapes that we inhabit. Um, the challenges we face in addressing what we consider the critical issues, I often think, have little to do with the issues themselves and everything to do with healing the divides that polarize and isolate us. The irony to me is that working together to transcend the boundaries we create is addressing the really big issue. And as Peter Senge said, wrote in his book, The Fifth Discipline, The Art and Practice of the Learning Organization, in the end, all boundaries are arbitrary. We invent them, and then ironically, we find ourselves trapped within them. So you probably thought this would never come to an end, <laughs> come to an end, but that is in fact the last slide. And I appreciate you hanging in for hours now. Steve, we never figured this long at all, huh? I mean, we talked about long, going long, but we we never I was figuring four at the most. This is I this was is, yeah. I was two and we're we're at two for six hours. <laughs> Thank you, Fred. Uh, thanks to you guys. I don't know. I that. Yeah, it's I, amazing I, stamina that you had and that your audience had. Yes. No. Absolutely. <laughs> and you know, surely we could have gotten through this probably in two to four if it had just been a march through it, right? If we just. Right. Uh, I mean, I, you could, but what's the value in that? I. I to me, what's nice is just to have people talking and, you know, if I were doing this in a, in a, as it would have been in a course, this would have been over several times of just a discussion, right? I mean, it wouldn't have been just one ma marathon, we'd have picked up from one thing to the next, but given how everything is nowadays, um, 
I, I just want to tell you, I, I did spend a lot of time working on this and thinking about it because I really did want to, to it, with the times now, it's kind of healing for me to, to, to think of and go through this and then to have a conversation. I wanted to, I think it helps. It helps. For me, it helps to talk with other people about all that's happening and just, um, so I appreciate it. I appreciate the opportunity. And I know we didn't get this done in April, um, Susan, what we'd initially planned, but, but we got it done now anyway, huh? Much better. Because it only would have been an hour and a half in April. Yes, and, and it would have been a different talk. I mean, it would have had some elements of this, but it, it wouldn't have been, um, it, it wouldn't have been as, I think, all inclusive as this talk tried to be. And as I've told you and Steve, <clears throat> the, Chelsea Green would like me to do an audio version of Nourishment. And so I thought of, so I was preparing this, I thought, I'll just tell it like this. I don't want to read the book but I thought I'll just use this as a way, as a template to do, to do that. And uh, so that that's where I found you on Chelsea Green's website. Yeah. I remember that. I you found did. you. <laughs> I remember that you did. And that's been a couple of years ago now. Yeah. Miss Butts oh. connected us. That's right. Christina. Christina yes. Butts. Yes. And she's still, she's still promoting the book in acres USA. I don't know if you get that, but, the, the recent issue, they sent me three copies of it, and Sue said, "Well, why'd they send it?" And I, we, we get it. But so why'd they send three issues? I said, "I don't know. Usually they do that when you write an article for it." And uh, and I hadn't, I hadn't written any article for it, and uh, so I started looking through, and sure enough, there was a there was an article, and started eating as a creative act from death comes life and transformation and christina had excerpted from the book and just put that there so you were an author that was good i didn't have to write it then there there it was you know all the flavor of this <laughs> well hopefully this will this will help you with the process of uh figuring out the final form that you want to uh deliver it has very much. It has very much. And, you know, with that in mind, if you, not, not to make you work anymore, but it, if any of you have any suggestions rel relative to what we covered and that as an audio book, it doesn't have to be detailed. But if you have any thoughts or suggestions, pass them along to me. I'm all ears. I, I've been, you know, we're, they, they need a transcript of it. it. It does have to get read. It can't be, because at first I said, well, listen, I'll just, Let's just record this for 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 the for you guys, and then we'll we'll use that. So no, you have to have a script. But if so you what have you can, what you can do is you once it's on YouTube, there's a thing on YouTube where it will transcribe it. And you've got all the words, and you can just kind of go back and use that as a template. Yeah, except it, what, it'll be misspelled and mistyped, course, and mis everything in the process, and you'll have to spend just as much time editing it as you would transcribing it in the first place. Yes. Well, I'll, I'll try to figure how to do that. But if you do have any suggestions about the material that was covered and, uh, and so forth, anything that would be a, a general suggestion, I, I'd welcome it for certain, you know? Okay. Yeah. There's a I couple of hope. things that I would suggest and I'll okay. send you, I'll send you an email about it. Thank you. That'd be perfect. I'll, I'll take it on board because it's, uh, um, in the process of trying to work on that, so send them along, Steve. And if any uh, any of you other folks have thoughts, send them along. The only thing I would say, and there's no nothing wrong with what you've got. I love what you have. Is a little more on soil. That would be more interesting. Just a little teeny bit more about the soils. The what okay. Going on with soil, and then um, I wanted to tell you that I thought your visuals were very good. That was a good, very good presentation. Are you your own artist? Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, they're important, right? I, I came to realize that over the years, that it's very important to, 
to have good visuals that go along with things. I think that's just so critical. It, you could give the same thing with crappy visuals and it's not nearly as effective. Huh? It, yeah. they, they matter a lot. They matter. And music, I've often thought adding music would be so, is so powerful, huh? If you were doing it, not, if you had a recorded voice, then music would be good. But I think in this situation, it's better yeah. not to have music. But yeah. um, what was the other thing? Oh, have you ever seen that movie? Where are you located, Fred? I came in late, so I'm not sure. Are you in, where do you live? We're, we're living in Innes, Montana right now. Okay. You know that, did you ever see that movie, Let It Grow? No. Did you ever see that movie? Um, no. I'll try to send you a link to it. It's a gu another guy in Montana. I thought you were in Montana. That's what I'm saying. He created a greenhouse uh, using scraps from the lumber yard he's across the street from and created a, a closed system. He can grow pineapples and bananas in Montana in the winter. And, oh, send it. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'll send you my link to get in and see the movie. Okay, I'd, I'd love it. it. I'd love it. It's terrific. If you guys haven't seen it yet, anybody can see Let It Grow. I think that's what it's called. <laughs> I'm forgetting exactly, but it's utterly fantastic. He can power a hundred homes from that greenhouse. Closed effect, no problem on the environment. He's got algae growing and he's got water in the bottom and algae. I, I don't know how it all works, but it's it's utterly fantastic and inspiring. And you guys should get together. So. No, absolutely, and it's something we would be really interested in trying to do here in yeah. in Innes. So that his name is Michael Smith. I think it's something really, really uh, um, common. Smith, huh? Yeah, yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll send you this. I'll send it. I've got your email, so I'll send it to you. Okay, perfect. That's perfect. Okay. Yeah, I appreciate it. I knew a guy named Mike Mike Smith, so I'll be able to at least remember that name. <laughs> okay. All right. That's all I've got. <laughs> well, I want to thank you, Fred, for all this very diligent work and excellent presentation. Next week, folks, is John Gray at our normal time. What's the normal time? I don't know. It changes all the time. evening, 7 to what, 9. When we used to be a non-virtual organization oh, yeah. in Palo Alto, it was always 7 to 9 on Thursday evenings. Okay. The third John Gray is evening. very dramatic. So dynamic. we've actually been true that one quarter of our broadcasts are done at that time. So, uh, but every everybody else, we're just mixing it up and we're doing it in the morning and we're yeah. doing it on weekends <laughs> and we're doing it in the evening, just depending upon who we're trying to connect with. That's what I wondered when we were scheduling. It seemed so open to what whatever. I know. Yeah, some people have trouble when I say pick any two hour period in that month or that week. And some people just, uh. so those people, I, I usually just say, well, what about this? If you don't like it, pick anything else. <laughs> I, I, right. A couple people I've noticed that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I was wondering too when you said that. Now yeah. I understand and came to understand as we went along, but I was, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's one in December, the same thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay. Thanks, okay. everybody. Thank so much, Congratulations Thank on you. unprecedented stamina. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. For everyone here today. <laughs> Thanks to all of you. I so appreciate you. Know, so I, I just okay. wish sometime I could meet you in person. Yeah, that would be lovely. I'm afraid it'll probably happen. I'm coming to Montana. Look out. It, Hi, look I, out. We're all coming. It probably will happen. Huh? Taste your chicken. And those coincidences. I I could believe it'll happen. Have a wonderful rest of your day, all of you. Well, it's bedtime for Will me. <laughs> <laughs> hey. Been up all night. Okay.